Why are we so exhausted and how can we find solutions? That's the topic we're going to address today on Flourishment. I'm your host, Tina Yeager. Today, I have a very special guest on Flourishment. Today, I have Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith. She is an award-winning, best-selling author, a physician, a sought-after speaker, and she has written a book called Sacred Rest, which is why she's here today today. She's also the host of I Choose My Best Life podcast, where she shares biblical insight to help others live fully, love boldly, and rest intentionally. We're here to talk about why rest is God's best, Dr. Smith. So tell us why this is important to you. And thank you, first of all, for coming on the show today. Well, thank you, Tina. It's a pleasure to be here with you. This is important to me because I burned out. So it's a topic that I know intimately. It's not just something that I study. And the everything that I share within the book, Sacred Rest, is really coming from my own journey of getting to a place of not always living with my hair on fire and understanding that there is a, a need for not balance, but harmony in our lives, where we are giving value to the work as well as giving value to rest. So why is it that we don't feel rested even if we do manage to get so many hours of sleep at night? Yeah, that's the that's the question, isn't it? I think for a lot of us, we have gotten into a place where rest is simply about cessation. So we only think of rest as sleeping or napping or stopping. And so we're not actually evaluating rest in the fullness of what it can be. Rest at its very core should be restorative. It's a process of pouring back into places of deficiency or depletion. And so when we simply think of stopping, we actually aren't always being restored when we stop something. And so, for example, when we go to sleep, yes, we have stopped. So our physical body and maybe our senses and our mind might be quieted, but we can't get emotional rest or social rest or even creative rest in bed. It can't be improved simply by stopping. It requires intentional restorative practices to pour back into those places of depletion. So for some of us, we go to bed saying, I'm tired. I should wake up fully restored the next morning. But the type of tired we are isn't the type that's restored when our eyes are closed. So physical rest is not the only type of rest we need. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. So within the book and within my research and studies that we have looked at seven different areas. So it's seven different areas where you can become fatigued. In essence, seven different areas where you can need rest and restoration. And so those seven include physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, social, sensory, and creative. And you need to restore those in order to feel rested. So it's not just about stopping. You have to put something in. That's very interesting. I don't think most people are aware of the putting back in part. We are experiencing exhaustion. And what are the physical dangers of that? Because sometimes people will say, well, creative rest, that's not really that important. And even, you know, you know, the famous Jack London line, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And then he died early. That's, that's not good. But there's more types of being burned out, aren't there? Oh, absolutely. And I and I hear that often. I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, it's, it's one of those things where it, we say it jokingly, but it actually does decrease your lifespan when you're not getting adequate rest and restoration. It, it's basically the chronic stress cycle that a lot of people are living in. They are chronically, their cortisol levels are chronically high. They're chronically in go mode or fight or flight, as some we sometimes refer to it as. So their body stays in this hyper alert state. And so they're at higher risk for elevated blood pressure. They're at higher risk for anxiety. They have a harder time concentrating because their mind is kind of rapid firing rather than going into deep focus. These are the same people who lay down at night and they can't get their brain to shut up because their head is just processing all the information. And so all of these kind of hyper agitated responses that we have, have negative physical effects as well. As your cortisol level goes up, that increases your insulin response, which then it puts you at higher risk for everything from every inflammatory disease out there, including heart disease and strokes, to also having an increased likelihood of having some other type symptoms, such as difficulty being able to actually have your reflexes respond quickly. So when someone is hyper agitated, their reflexes are usually worse. So this is the person who's going to appear clumsy, 
not because they're clumsy, but it's because their reflexes aren't as quick or as sharp as they could be. It's also the same person who may find themselves saying things like, I don't have the patience for X, Y, Z job. Well, do you not have the patience or are you just overagitated? <laughs> they're not the same thing. So I think we have to realize that it, it affects our physical bodies, but it also affects our long-term health. It affects how our body is used and it affects our relationships. So from what I'm hearing you say, it's not just that we need to worry about our physical rest, but all of these things will impact our physical well-being. It's not a separate, okay, so check the box. I'm physically rested. I should be physically okay. And the creative rest is only going to affect my creative productivity. All of them sound like they're connected. Is that right? They are because you're connected. You're you're one single being. And so, and I fear, I fear that's the, the disconnect that a lot of us have. We think that some of them we can just do without. But then when we someone asks, how are we feeling? Our response is typically, I'm tired. And I and we really have to be a little bit more specific to be able to solve that problem. Rather than saying, I'm tired, to then evaluate what kind of tired are you? What is exactly fatigued? Because I, you can say you're tired and sleep 10 hours and still wake up exhausted if the fatigue you're dealing with is actually, let's say, an emotional fatigue. If you're a counselor or a teacher or a therapist or a doctor or a nurse or, or a pastor, anyone who's dealing with emotional things with other people, you're processing their emotions, you're processing how you emote back to them, you're an empath. You're sympathetic to someone. All of these use emotional energy. And so you may not be necessarily going through a depressive state, but you're managing emotions around you and you're in part having to manage your emotional response to even their emotions. And so we don't realize some of the energy that we're using throughout the day. And then we can't understand why we are so tired, even though clinically we don't check any of the boxes for clinically depressed. You can have an emotional rest deficit simply because of the professional emotional labor, the type of work or career you have places on you. So even though these are all connected, we do need to take the time to inventory which places still need to be restored and restore those places individually. Absolutely. Absolutely. That that's really the core of where we have an assessment called restquiz.com. And it's basically it walks you through a series of questions to help you identify which of the seven types of rest you're most efficient in. All seven of these are active in everyone's life. Some of them you're probably already excelling at because you've already developed mechanisms and ways that you manage to keep those levels healthy. Some of them you may have never heard of, and those may be the places where you're depleted. And because you do not have a restorative strategy in place or have, have even thought about what a restorative strategy could be, you may be deficient in one of the areas where you use primarily throughout your day. What we're finding is most of the time people will have an area that's a rest deficit that they use every single day at work. But because it's not something they've ever been taught or something they've ever even thought about, that one area can stay depleted because they haven't been intentional about a restorative practice in that area. Which are some of the ones that are sneaky areas of rest that people aren't often aware of that they might be surprised that they are deficient in? I'll give you two. Um, one is sensory. A lot of us are not aware of our sensory inputs. And so we don't realize that some of the irritation, agitation that we have is not because of emotional or even social reasons. It's because we have so much sensory stimuli in our lives that it keeps our, our systems kind of overly agitated. So everything from the the dinging on your cell phone notifications to the lights and the sounds in your office space to the kids playing in the background if you work from home or the radio that you keep playing 24-7, all of these things can be adding to your sensory overwhelm. Oftentimes we'll say, I zone out those things or I tune out those things without realizing that it's impossible to tune something out without your brain processing it. The brain has to filter and process it for your subconscious to even be able to tune something out. So it's using energy, whether you think you're using energy or not. That's the only way you can 
filter something out of your space. And so if you're doing that for extended periods of time, thinking you're zoning it out, you're basically just using up some of that sensory energy in your brain. And so at the end of the day, this is why so many people notice that like road rage or agitation seems to increase between 3 and 5 p.m. In the morning, we don't have road rage. Nobody is sensory overwhelmed in the morning. By the evening, we've become sensory overwhelmed. So now the honking of the horns, the, the driving sounds, all of these things become too much. And so we have to be aware that sensory overwhelm for most of us presents itself as irritation, agitation, rage, or anger. It's not an emotional issue. It's your, your brain's response to too much sensory input. Another one could be if you're someone who finds that you have a hard time kind of processing information at the end of the, end of the day. You have a hard time making decisions or being creative or thinking outside of the box. This oftentimes can be a creative rest deficit. Creative energy is used every time we have to problem solve. So every time you have to figure out how to do something, every time you have to come up with a schedule solution when you need to get one child to soccer and the other child's got to be somewhere else across town at the same time. You're using all of this creative energy without thinking that you're creative because we oftentimes think of creativity as just um, artistic creativity, not the creativity of problem solving. So everybody from teachers to architects to engineers, every all of these are creative endeavors. It's using the process of the brain that is more innovative. And so we have to then be aware that you can feel tired because that part of your brain has been fatigued as well if you're using that throughout the day. That is absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure it's mind-blowing for everyone that's listening and watching this program. So how can people get that tool that you mentioned and get a copy of your book and access all the resources to really dive into what's going on with them and begin to seek healing? The resource is called Rest Quiz. It's simply at restquiz.com. And then the book is titled Sacred Rest, Recover Your Life, Renew Your Energy, Restore Your Sanity. And it's available wherever books are sold. In this second half of our conversation with Dr. Sondra Dalton-Smith, I want to get into some practical ways that we can begin to restore. But first, my first question is, are there some people who have a harder time in each of these areas than others? When you mentioned in our first half of our conversation, that sensory deficit of rest being a specific one, my mind as a therapist automatically went to sensory integration disorder where some people really struggle with that. Is that true for all the areas of rest where certain people will find that they struggle more in certain areas than others? I believe so. There's, I oftentimes will get information from people who are uh, neurodivergent or have other specifics within their, themselves as far as how they relate to different types of rest. And so it can vary. So there automatically are some specifics per person just because of their own background, their lifestyle, the way they use different things from at work and at home that will predispose rather some people to have rest deficit in certain areas. But what I find often is if someone has like an underlying either medical or psychological or physical condition that predisposes them to a specific rest deficit, they tend to already be working on that area because they are they've all they've already noticed the dysfunction, so to speak, that happens within them when that area gets off balance. So typically that's an area that most people have already thought about. Like, for example, people who are autistic will often say, well, I, I knew there was some type of sensory thing that I was noticing when I got in certain situations. They may not have known the details behind it or even really associated it with something as rest and restoration, but they knew that there was something that was occurring in these situations. They could tell that their body was responding negatively in some way. So we're tending to have rest deficits in the areas where we think we're fine. Is that what you're saying? No, some people actually are fine in some areas. So I usually put it this way. If you find yourself, if you go to bed and you sleep eight hours, nine hours, whatever your normal time frame is, and you wake up the next morning and you feel tired, that's when you stop and you ask the question, why am I not feeling better? 
because technically you should wake up every morning feeling energized, ready to start your day, excited for your day. There should be some level of, I feel prepared to enter into this day. And if you're not feeling that, something is not right. Now, as a physician, I always say we should probably start just to make sure there isn't some underlying medical issue, right? You don't have sleep apnea. You don't have diabetes. You don't have something else, you know, that's actually underlying it, that's causing it. And so if all of those things come back negative, you know, there's nothing physically or, you know, medically wrong with you, then it's a matter of are there rest deficits? Are there places in my self that are not getting restored. And so the way I started this with my own health journey was looking at what are ways that I'm using energy throughout the day. I think that's a good place for most of us to start. So just look at your day and what kind of energy do I use? I think often we're not even aware of how we use energy. You know, you may be spending all day working with clients as a counselor and you're thinking, well, I'm sitting in a chair I'm not necessarily, you know, using a lot of physical energy, but you're probably using a lot of social energy because you're having to engage with these people. So they are pulling from your social energy. They are not life giving necessarily to you. They are pulling from your social energy because you are life giving to them. And so then you have to evaluate, are there relationships in my life where they are life giving? where the person in front of me is not needing anything from me. They are not pulling from my social energy and start looking at who are the people in my life who don't need anything from me, who are the people that I can just hang out with and have fun and there's no expectation, there's no pull on me socially. It's just a relationship where I get fed and it's celebrated and enjoy because a lot of us don't have that. And that sometimes is the rest that we're needing, the, re the rest of life-giving relationships because everybody in our life are people who's pulling from us. It's our kids, it's our family, it's our spouse. And if no one is actually in our life that is actually on purpose pouring back into us. So that's sometimes the issue. And then, you know, the other things, like if we're using the counselor as an example, another thing could be you're sitting in front of a client who's giving you, you know, a horrific life story of what happened to them, telling all the details and all of that. And if you're an empath, you may start feeling some of those emotions. You're sad for them. Uh, an example I often use as a physician, oftentimes when I'm at the bedside of a patient who's dying, these aren't strangers to me. This is oftentimes patients I've been treating for years. So I know the dog's name. I know the spouse. You know, I know everybody in the family. And so as someone who has a tendency to have a very soft heart, I may want to cry in that moment because my friend's on that table dying. But you'll never see a teardrop because I know it doesn't serve the patient, the family, my nursing staff. So I keep all of those emotions in check. But I need moments in my life of emotional rest when I can release that in a safe place where it's not disrespecting the patient or the family or my staff. And I can tend to my own emotional health by releasing that somewhere. And so I think we need to realize that Every job has ways that it can develop a rest deficit. And then if we're not intentional, we can get into toxic uh, situations where they never receive the rest and restoration that's needed. This is so fascinating. And I'm learning so much that I thought I knew what it meant to rest, but this is all new and wonderful and very important information for everyone to know. So can you tell us, just a few of the ways that we can look forward to finding solutions for these rest deficits. Yeah, so um, I'll start with some of the ones we talked about. So, you know, we talked about sensory rest. So if you're someone who finds that you do have a lot of noise or lights and sounds and all the things in your background, a couple of ways you can improve that. Um, using noise cancellation earphones, not necessarily trying to listen to something, but actually to block out the noise. So you're sitting at your desk, you're doing work, you hear, you know, the elevators going off down the hall, popping in the earphones for maybe 30 minutes just to have a moment of sensory deprivation. If you're a mom working from home and the kids are nonstop talking, putting the noise cancellation earphones on where you actually can still see your kids, you know, no one's killing each other but you actually don't have to hear them the entire time that they're playing or doing whatever they're doing. Um, another thing would be if you're someone who has a mental rest deficit and you lay down at night and your brain just kind of keeps regurgitating all the information and ruminating over it, 
having a notepad or journal at the bedside where you can do what we call a brain dump, where you jot down whatever that is your brain's regurgitating, whether it's a to-do list or something not to forget the next day. By jotting it down, you then give your brain permission to release it because it's not having to keep regurgitating it to try to keep it in there. Physical rest, if your physical rest has two forms, it has the passive, which we talked about sleeping and napping, but it also has an active form, which includes things like stretching or massage therapy or going for a leisure walk or something like that. So if you're someone who maybe you find that your body gets real tight while you're at work all day, part of a physical rest strategy would be having some breaks where you stand up or maybe having a standing desk where you do part of your work standing and part sitting. If you're someone who has a problem with creative rest deficits, you spend a lot of time processing and uh, thinking outside of the box and solving problems, finding the things in your life, the beauty in your life that actually inspires your creative part. So what in, kind of sparks your internal creativity, that childlike awe and wonder? For a lot of people, it's nature scenes. So the oceans, the mountains, the trees. For other people, it could be artwork. Um, for other people, it could be music or dance or theater. But figuring out what it is that actually sparks creativity inside of you, that awakens that part of you. And then finding ways of bringing that into your day, whether that's having screens on your com lock screens on your computer or your phone, where you images that are inspirational to you pop up or even having like a theme in your house. Maybe it's a nautical theme in your office space, an accent wall, a splash of color that's inspirational to you. But recognizing that there are ways to layer in restorative practices where you're not always having to think about, oh, I need to set aside 30 minutes to get this type of rest. Some of these things are things that you can make habitual. You bring into a part of your life and you make adjustments so that you have some intentionality in what's surrounding you so that you can be restored on a continuous basis. This is such great information. I want you to take just a moment to address to all those who are in any kind of ministry, whether it's volunteer or staff ministry, about why it is God's will that we rest because people in ministry tend to be the ones that are least likely to take the rest that they need. They're constantly 24 seven, go, 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 go processing, trying to do something for somebody else. I don't know if you found that to be true in the people that you work with, the people that are in ministry and we are in ministry actually in a way. So can you talk about that just a little bit about why this is part of being obedient to God's design? Yeah, it's it's really interesting that um, you know the entire book comes from the, from scripture and it starts all the way back to Genesis, the very first time rest is even mentioned. And I think what sometimes happens is because we the work that you're doing when you're in ministry is work that is specifically to build up the kingdom of God, to to edify and to empower the people of God. We think we get a pass on doing things God's way. It's like, well, I'm, I'm doing it for you, so I don't have to do it the way you said, right? I mean, that's how we approach rest. I mean, from the very beginning, rest has been a precept. If we look even in the current um, Hebrew culture, you know, it's one of those things where it's still practiced. The Sabbath is still practiced every single Saturday. Now, I don't tell people they have to practice Sabbath on any specific day, but what I do tell people is when we look at the reason behind Sabbath, it's the very same reason why rest was introduced in the first place. We hear that on the sixth day, man was created, you know, God spoken to mankind, commissioned them, all those things. And then on the seventh day, God rested. Well, when I was doing the study for and the work for this book, one of the things that kept popping up in my mind was, what was man doing on the seventh day? Because if you read that scripture, it doesn't say any work was actually done till after that day of rest. And so it was then that I started to kind of get a clear understanding of why there. this is such a battle spiritually for most of us. Uh, the world teaches us that if we work enough, then we will earn the right to rest. When the work is done, now it's a time to rest. However, the biblical precept of rest is completely the opposite of that. God created mankind, spoke into mankind, told them who they are, have dominion, multiply all of the things. But before mankind was actually ever sent out to do the work, mankind's first full day on the earth was the day of rest. 
Mankind wasn't there when the sixth day started. They were Their first full day was that seventh day. And I think we need to kind of reshape our thinking to that process, that each day of rest is actually where we are to begin. We're not to be working to earn our rest, but we should actually be working from this place of rest. That is in these places of rest with God is where we are empowered by his spirit to then go out and do what he's told us our commissioning is to go do. We're not doing it in our own power, which is what burns us out, makes us angry, makes us people who other people don't want to be around. We've all heard the stories of the angry Christian. Well, if you get exhausted, just like I said, the sensory overload, irritation, agitation, rage, and anger, rest solves that. Your fruit is sweeter when you are not someone who's burned out. Burned out Christians have fruit that is very sour. And so I think we need to realize that when you can't, when you don't have joy, when peace is hard to find, when you are battling within yourself because your own behaviors and actions don't reflect the fruit of the spirit that you know are possible, it's not always that you don't have a relationship with God. It's that you're actually not honoring the relationship he wants to have with you. One where you trust him enough to stop and rest. Mm, this is so good. This is really about the principle of living in God's grace and love instead of trying to earn it in a sense. So I, I could talk to you about this for hours, but unfortunately we've run out of time. I know, however, you have a wealth of information, a wonderful book. So if people want to know more, how can they get in touch with you and get all the great resources that you can continue to provide for them to find God's best in rest for their lives? Yes, my main website is ichoosemybestlife.com. And from there, they can learn about all the different resources we have, including they can get access directly from there to Rest Quiz, where they can take the assessment to see which of the seven types of rest they need most. And it also has the information about how to get a copy of the book, Sacred Rest. Thank you, Sandra. And thank all of you for listening. I know that you were inspired and enlightened on this show. I hope that you will go to Dr. Sandra Dalton Smith's website and get a copy of Sacred Rest and access the resources that she has there. And of course, I also hope that you will hit subscribe and come back for the next episode of Flourishment. <music>